Okay, let's get started. Um, this is the last lecture of this semester. Uh, I see the attendance has dwindled to just a few of you, so um, this lecture will be fairly short, but also probably pretty fun. Um, it covers uh, some work that was originally written up uh, around 2020 with the publication of GPT-3 and um, has since been updated with very recent work from this March, um, which we'll talk about in a bit. And we will also cover some of the um, training decisions and capabilities of the newest of these large language models, the POM uh, model from Google. So before we start, uh, your homework is due today. You have a quiz that's due in a couple days, and then you have your final report, so make sure you're um, on top of all of that. Okay, so uh, when we talk about scaling laws for large language models, we're mainly interested in answers to the following question or related question. So given a fixed compute budget, what is the optimal model size and training data set size for training a transformer language model? And so, um, you know, we have seen over this semester many different transformer language models, right? We talked a lot about GPT-3, which had 175 billion parameters and 300 billion uh, training data set tokens. But there have been many others that have been released that vary this. And as we'll see a little later, uh, one of the newer models called Chinchilla decides to be smaller but be trained on a much larger number of tokens. And, um, you know, these, each of these efforts takes a huge uh, amount of resources and time to obtain. So, when I ask a question like this, um, you know, do any of you have any ideas on why this is an important question to answer, or at least have a good idea about? Like, if you look at a table like this, right, each of these models probably cost millions of dollars to, to train, let alone in energy costs, and, and so, you know, why, why might we care about the answer to this question? Yeah, uh, so certainly with the carbon footprint and how easy it is to train the model, we might want to know the answers to these questions. Anyone else have an idea? Exactly. So each one of these takes months, even on like, uh, you know, huge scale compute and costs a lot of money and takes a lot of uh, carbon footprint. So we can't just try out every possible combination of you know, all right, here's a 200 billion parameter model trained on 500 billion tokens, or here's a 300 billion parameter model trained on 400 billion tokens, right? That, that is just not feasible. And so what we have empirically is all these different groups have tried various things, but we still aren't really sure, um, you know, if this is the right way to go. And as we'll see later, many of these uh, papers were based on faulty assumptions. So the, the way in which people decide, you know, how many parameters and how many trading data tokens is through projections based on what are called scaling laws. So people have done a lot of experiments at a smaller scale and fitted sort of power laws to various, like how does the loss change if I add X more parameters or X more tokens? and then extrapolated from these laws to much bigger regimes like what we have here. So it's extremely important to get those scaling laws as close to reality as possible, because otherwise people will train things based on extrapolations from a faulty um, hypothesis, uh, which, uh, again, we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. But, yeah, I mean, this is also very important in terms of hyperparameter selection, like a compute budget means, means a lot, as we'll discuss later. There are several things that could affect your, um, how much compute you use. So 
it, it's not just the model size, but also how many iterations you train your model, or uh, what is the batch size of your model, and all of these decisions play a role in determining how you're using your compute. So, you know, it's extremely hard to make these decisions if you're training one of these models. Um, also, uh, Facebook, or sorry, Meta just released this new OPT model, which is an open access version of GPT-3, essentially. And one nice thing that they did uh, with the release is they released their training logbook. So you can see for, I don't know, a, a month or two every day, like what issues did they encounter when training this model? There are so many things where it's like, oh, the loss just randomly spiked, what do we do? Um, there's so many random things that go on and it's very difficult once you are like halfway through one of these insanely long training runs to just stop and change something and then restart, right? So um, training these kinds of models is not just picking you know, some hyperparameters, some data sets, some model, and then clicking go and waiting two months and then it's done. It actually requires constant monitoring, adjustments. Um, sometimes you might find that your model's lost spike, so you may need to revert to a previous checkpoint and try with different data. As we'll see in even the POM paper, uh, some of these things are kind of inexplicable. and. Uh, no one really knows why they occur, but they, they happen, have happened to all of these groups during the training of their models. Um, also, these scaling laws affect performance, right? So this uh, model right here, and this is the Megatron Turing whatever model, it has 530 billion parameters and was trained on 270 billion tokens. And the model we'll be talking about later, this POM model has about a similar order of parameters, but was trained on much more data and trained for longer. Um, all of these decisions affect, uh, and you know, this model was not even really as good as GPT-3, um, but uh, probably because it was trained on not enough data, and also perhaps it was under-trained overall. It's very difficult to decide when to stop training and a lot of these models are probably all of them are under trained like none of them are trained to convergence people will just pick you know here's my compute budget i have access to this cluster for this many days and that's all i'm going to train my model on because it's expensive right so um there are so many decisions and i know it kind of seems like um you know none of us is training models like this, so why should we care about this? But still, like these are important decisions that are being made by people who have access to these resources, and hopefully we can find a regime eventually in the future where it becomes more accessible to, to all. Okay, so one thing that we should discuss is what do we mean by a fixed compute budget? Like, how do we measure this, right? You could measure it by, like, hours in a data center or something like that, but most of the papers we'll be talking about use uh, more specific, uh, it's basically an estimate of the flops that are used to train this model. So um, this comes from the 2020 scaling laws paper. If you take n to be the total number of model parameters, they exclude the embeddings uh, parameters because those could, could vary across models depending on vocab size and tokenization choice and so on. So if you take n to be just the non-embedding parameters in the model, and um, you take c, now c is your estimated compute, which is um, this formula, six times n times b times s. So we know what n is, the total number of parameters in the model. b is the batch size that you're using to train the model. So this isn't perfect because sometimes you, know, you could adapt your batch size. As we'll see in the POM paper, they actually increase their batch size during training, but you know, it's, it's an approximation. Um, s is the number of training steps, uh, which is parameter updates. So if you're doing mini batch training, right, you pass a batch through your network, compute the loss, then you do a parameter update. Uh, after that, so how many uh, steps do you take before you're done with training? Um, again, most of these models are not trained to convergence, so they might pick some fixed number of uh, steps to train for. So 
Um, and another interesting question is what is this uh, factor of six? Uh, where does this come from? So does anyone have any ideas why, why we might have some factor here that we're multiplying all this by? This is the total number of uh, compute used uh, to train the model. Yeah, exactly. So uh, back prop is about twice as expensive as forward prop. And forward prop, it, it kind of depends on your impl implementation of the various uh, computations going on. But um, I, they even mentioned in the scaling laws paper that um, something like matrix multiplication might be implemented by an accumulation or something like that. So the, um, even during forward prop, you're doing twice as many um, operations as you might otherwise. And then back prop is twice as expensive. So um, they estimated this factor to be six. And in the Chinchilla paper, they um, had a much uh, more specific estimate. But it was actually very close to six. So this, this is actually a pretty good estimate for the total number of compute that is used while, while training these models. And um, you can see that the metric that they use here, because uh, this is going to be huge, um, is uh, petaflop days. So this is like how many petaflops you can do in, in, in a day, um, it, assuming like full utilization. All right, so with that out of the way, um, let's get to some answers to these questions. So what I wanted to do is basically go over three papers. And the first one is this Kaplan et al. Um, scaling Laws of Large Language Models paper. Um, the second one, the Chinchilla paper, paper, will show that some of the assumptions made in this first work are incorrect and led to incorrect scaling laws, which kind of influenced all of these uh, people who train their models to use suboptimal configurations of model size and training data size. Um, but let's take a look at this. So this is a figure, one of the main figures from this scaling laws paper. On the y-axis, you see the test loss of the language model. So essentially, it's um, the cross entropy loss when predicting held out tokens in the test set. So lower is, of course, better. So you can see that for all three of these um, uh, aspects, the model size, the data set size, and the number of parameters, for each plot, they kept the other two constant. So they were only changing like one factor. So given that the model size and the number of parameters is the same, um, you can just keep training for more and more steps, right? And so you can increase your compute, and that seems to lower the loss, is not surprising, right? Um, similarly, with the data set size, um, if you uh, are, uh, you know, keep everything else the same, increasing the data set size will uh, also lower your loss, and finally, the number of parameters. Um, so this is looking at each thing separately, but one of the more important findings from this paper is that for optimal scaling, when you increase the model size, you also need to increase the data set size simultaneously. Otherwise, you'll get to a regime where, so let's say you have fixed your model at 20 billion parameters and you're just increasing your data as much as you can go, you will get to a regime of diminishing returns. Like that language model will not be able to take advantage of the data and its model size needs to actually be increased. We'll see this again with the Palm paper where it showed that you know, a language model that is smaller does not exhibit the same capabilities as one that is much larger. So there are like entire capabilities of these models that are only like unlocked at uh, much larger scales. So I wanted to just go to the paper because they have a nice summary of, um, and this was done by people at OpenAI um, around the time GPT-3 was released. So uh, the, the paper begins with a summary of the key findings. So I'm just going to go over some of these. Um, hopefully this is readable. So the first finding, which is kind of interesting, is that performance, so here performance is referring to the uh, loss, the test loss of the language model. It depends 
a lot on scale, so like how many total parameters are in the model, but it isn't really affected by the shape or like architectural configuration of the model. So one question you might have, you know, we've gone through transformers and so on, is okay, well, if I want to go from a 5 billion parameter model to a 10 billion parameter model, where should I add those extra parameters? Should I add more transformer blocks? Or should I make my existing blocks wider? Should I add more attention heads? Should I increase the dimensionality of my embeddings or my model or whatever? Uh, it turns out that those decisions are not really important. Um, the thing that is important is just the number of parameters. Um, those other things may make slight uh, contributions to, uh, I think there's a, a graph in the Chinchilla paper that shows it can affect your loss by a couple percent, but um, overall not a huge factor. So um, yeah, they, they say model performance depends most strongly on scale, which they divide into these three factors, the total number of model parameters, the size of the data set, and the amount of compute used uh, during training. Performance depends very weakly on other architectural hyperparameters such as depth and width. So then, um, performance has a power law relationship with each of the three scale factors, N, D, and C, while not bottlenecked by the other two. So this is interesting because it means for if, if you have data for some smaller classes of models, you can predict what will happen with a much bigger model, and then you can use those predictions to decide what huge model uh, to train, like how much, uh, how big the model should be and how much data you need to have. So um, this point is uh, interesting and also misleading in this paper. Performance improves predictably as long as we scale up N, the model size, and D, the training data set size, in tandem, but enters a regime of diminishing returns if either N or D is held fixed while the other increases. Um, so this part is the one that is uh, now um, you know, known to not be true. The performance penalty depends predictably on this ratio which means that every time we increase the model size by eight times, we only need to increase the data by roughly five times to avoid a penalty. So, um, you know, they observe this empirically through running a ton of experiments and figuring out that, you know, this is the ratio that leads to optimal test loss given a fixed budget. However, there are a lot of different hyperparameters related to the model and the optimizer that are extremely important to handle when you're doing experiments like this. And one thing that in this paper they didn't do is uh, um, adjust the learning rate schedule when they add more training data to the model. This turns out to be hugely important. So um, we talked about this briefly when we discussed the transformer but its learning rate is actually scheduled as a function of the uh, what batch you're on. So initially it starts off pretty low and then it warms up to some high value and then kind of uh, decays as training proceeds. But the shape of that curve, um, that is very important and it turns out that you need to adjust you know, how many batches do you warm up for and where do you start decaying as you increase the size of your training data set. And so in the Chinchilla paper, which came out this March, they actually accounted for that and found completely different uh, relationship between the data and the model size. And in fact, the optimal um, ratio that they found was 50-50. So if you scale up your model by 8x, you should also scale up your data by 8x. And that actually indicates that, you know, we might want to have a bigger focus on high quality, large scale data rather than um, anything to do with the model. Yeah. What's the purpose of the warm-up and learning rate? What's the purpose of the warm-up? That is a great question that is kind of unknown. Um, it was something that in the original Transformer paper they found to be critical to getting the model to train at all. Um, in fact, uh, a couple of years ago, one of my PhD students um, 
his first task as a student was to re-implement the transformer from scratch, um, which I would not recommend at all, um, as uh, I've never asked anyone else to do this. Uh, but, you know, he, he spent a lot of time um, trying to get it to work on like a machine translation data set, but it was never achieving anywhere close to the numbers that were reported in the paper. And he checked every single component of his model with, with no luck and finally realized that um, the learning rate schedule was not implemented in, in his model. So he was just using like whatever you normally would use in, in PyTorch and it, it wasn't working at all. So he switched to that schedule and instantly it just magically worked and reproduced the numbers in the paper. So uh, I don't know, I mean, there might have been some more theoretical explanation of this um, in subsequent follow-up papers that I don't know about, but um, it was kind of an empirical finding by the authors of that paper and has turned out to be critical for training um, ever since. All right. Um, See if there are any YouTube questions. Nope. All right. Um, okay. So some of these other ones uh, we uh, you can read about later. But another interesting point here is that large models are more sample efficient than small models. So we can see this in in this figure. So here they have trained a bunch of different models that vary in their size. So it says the line color indicates the number of parameters, darker is smaller and lighter is larger. So here on the rightmost side, you see a model with 10 to the third power, uh, 10 to the power of three parameters. And on the left side, this yellow curve, you see 10 to the nine. Um, so this is a much bigger model. So if you see the uh, test loss, this is on the same test set, you can see that this bigger model is achieving a lower loss faster than the smaller model, right? So let's see how long it takes to get, and so the x-axis here is the number of tokens that are processed, so basically the number of iterations that the, the model has seen. Um, you can see that, let's just pick a random um, value, maybe eight. So the uh, big model reaches a loss of eight at about 10 to the power of eight tokens. The small, smaller model um, takes uh, maybe like an order of magnitude more data to, to reach the same point. Um, and of course, it also just doesn't do as well overall. Like it flattens out at a much higher loss, whereas you can see this one is still going down. Okay, so um, yeah, and um, one, one interesting thing is that um, if you are working with a fixed compute budget, uh, but without restrictions on the model size and uh, data size, so basically let's say you have one day to train your language model, um, is it best to allocate like a, a very small model with as many um, training tokens as you can, or actually the opposite is what they find, is that you should just train an insanely huge model on as much data as you can get, get through in one day. Of course, it will not converge at all, but this is going to be a much better model than a smaller model trained for more iterations, because the bigger models are more sample efficient. Um, so, so that was pretty interesting as well. Um, and uh, also kind of sad for, for all of us because, uh, of course, it, this, uh, without any restrictions on model size or data size, is a pretty, uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that's not going to happen, right? You, can, you are always going to be restricted by how much memory you have on your GPU unless you are at one of these places where you can just get a huge uh, number of TPU pods or whatever. Um, okay, there's also some stuff on the optimal batch size that I won't go through. Um, it's basically a function of um, some things that you can measure. There's something called the critical batch size um, that they, they analyze here. But yeah, that was basically a summary of the, um, the results in this paper. Um, any questions on, yeah? Yes, the question is about pruning 
Um, I don't think pruning has been applied to models at this scale. Um, and one of the reasons is that the models themselves are not accessible, like the parameters are not accessible to um, people more broadly. So that's one thing that um, this new Facebook, uh, sorry, Meta's um, open GPT model will allow for, because um, now you can actually just, any of you can request access to this 175 billion parameter model, which is like 350 gigabytes. Um, you won't be able to load it. So that's like one of my students got access and then we were like, what, what can we do with this? We could be able, we may be able to load it on our GPU cluster if we like use a bunch of nodes, but is that worth it? Probably not. <laughs> um, but yeah, like if you get access to the model parameters, then you can start exploring these, these cases where maybe you can try pruning uh, to more reasonable size and seeing how the performance degrades and so on. Um, but yeah, that kind of research at this scale has been held back due to most of the people building the models not releasing them as well. I think you will need, for sure, 350 gigs of VRAM, um, probably more to hold whatever is going on in one batch. Um, but I mean, you could always, like at this point, you will probably be using the model for inference only. So yeah, I mean, it'll be roughly 350 gigs. Uh, but, but like no commercial GPU is going to allow for that, right? So. I think the, the biggest ones we have on our cluster are probably 24, maybe 48. Um, but yeah, you might have to load it across GPUs and that all becomes a little complicated. Especially like across nodes would be extremely, then you're like bottleneck by network. Um, yeah, it's all a mess. So um, even though this model exists, we'll probably continue using the OpenAI's uh, API <laughs> because it's much easier. Um, do you have a question? So, uh, do you have any image uh, seeing the model like mentioning the performance slightly but next to the right. uh, self one of the goals is it to perform these models into fine tune or maybe that. So is it that like better complexity also means like better generalization? Yeah, that's a great point. So these these curves, right, they're using cross entropy loss or it's a function of perplexity, right? A perplexity is a function of this. Um, but when we use these models, we're mainly looking for them not to be like great language models, but to solve all these different tasks using like prompt based learning and few shot or zero shot learning and so on. So does this correlate with that? And yeah, I mean, the answer is roughly yes, or at least people believe this to be true based on all the empirical findings that we have on, you know, the bigger the model, the lower the perplexity, the more capability it has on um, these downstream tasks. But I think for, and you can even check out the meta logbook of their training run, but most mostly they monitor the loss um, like this during training. It would be interesting to monitor you know, performance on some of the benchmarks that we'll talk about in a bit, but that might be a little more challenging to, to do. But that's a good question. Yeah, it, it's really not clear, but I think um, empirically speaking, it does definitely correlate. All right, so let's, uh, let's move on to um, this. So, so I already mentioned this uh, chinchilla work where they re-estimated some of these scaling laws after correcting for things like the learning rate schedule and so on. But this plot is essentially what I wanted to show from that paper. Uh, the dashed line here is what was predicted by the scaling laws of the paper we just went over, this Kaplan 2020. So in this plot, you see the number of parameters on the y-axis and the compute uh, on the x-axis. Um, so the dashed line is like the optimal um, split if you uh, predicted by Kaplan at all 2020. Um, and we have 
here the dashed line, so in this chinchilla paper, they have three different approaches to measure um, you know, how much model and data size do you need if you have a fixed uh, amount of compute. And so the, you can see that these three models, uh, GPT-3, this Megatron thing, and Gopher, which is one of Google's models, they were all trained to follow basically the scaling laws of this Kaplan 2020 paper. Um, so you can see that they're pretty close to this dashed line. But the actual uh, line is more like this, where, uh, and, and they, they just show that this is empirically true. They train a model called Chinchilla, which has only 70 billion parameters but is trained on like 1.4 trillion tokens. And um, they show that this is outperforms all of these other models despite being um, smaller. So we can take a look at this paper. Uh, and yeah, it's also nice to see how they estimate these kinds of uh, scaling laws. So this was done in 2022. Um, the scaling laws paper from 2020 trained uh, models that were much smaller than these on average. So um, perhaps the, the new power laws here are better estimates because they also included much bigger models in their experiments. But this is what they did. They trained over 400 language models ranging from 70 million parameters to over 16 billion parameters on a range of 5 to 500 billion tokens. And their main finding um, is for compute optimal training. So if you have a fixed budget of compute, how do you obtain the lowest loss? The answer is to scale the model size and the number of training tokens equally. So for every doubling of the model size, the number of training tokens should also be doubled. So not that other ratio that was um, presented in the previous paper. So then, they test this hypothesis by training a predicted compute optimal model that they called Chinchilla that uses the same compute budget as Gopher. I guess this was a previous model from this team. But it, had, it has 70 billion parameters and four times more data. And this sig uniformly and significantly outperforms Gopher, GPT-3, Jurassic 1, and Megatron Turing NLG on a large range of downstream tasks. So this is actually a pretty exciting development because it, it is the smallest of any of these models. 70 billion parameters is still huge, don't get me wrong. Like that's still much bigger than what you could um, reasonably do on any GPU. But it's also much smaller than something like this uh, Megatron model, which is 530 billion. Um, and yeah, it it even outperforms some of these existing works. So this paper as a whole just goes to show how important it is to get these parameters right before you start training, because otherwise um, you might end up with a suboptimal, undertrained model that just doesn't perform as well. Um, and yeah, I think this this just came out, you know, March 29th. So perhaps people will find further improvements over this and. Um, soon we'll have some more accessible models that have the same capabilities as these, these huge ones that we've seen. Um, okay, so I don't think I wanted to go over any of the um, things here. I already mentioned that the learning rate schedule was one of the key um, changes in this paper that they found to be pretty critical. Okay, and finally, I wanted to spend the rest of this lecture talking about the current, like, best of these huge language models, which came out a couple weeks ago called the POM. Um, so this came out April 19th, 2022. Um, and I think it is worthwhile to, to look through this because it has several interesting capabilities that are maybe not present or nowhere near as good uh, um, in, in other models. And interestingly, this paper and Chinchilla were released at roughly the same time, but Palm does not use this optimal, um, compute optimal budget. Uh, I, maybe these two teams were not talking to each other, but it would have been much better for them to, all I think um, this one is from DeepMind, and they, in their blog post, said something like, 
after we published this work, this POM model came out and um, our predicted allocation for their uh, compute budget would differ than what they actually did. They probably should have trained on like X trillion tokens and <laughs> instead of this and made their model smaller. But um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, maybe, maybe it'll start affecting um, future large language model training runs. Um, there is also an interesting technique that is described in this paper called chain of thought prompting that I think is, is pretty cool and uh, will probably be much more significant in the months to come. So I want to go over that as well. But first, um, I think this paper does a good job explaining like what model decisions they made and to the extent that they can explain why. I mean, sometimes it's just not, not so clear. Um, so I wanted to go through that first, but uh, yeah, um, they trained this on 6,144 TPU V4 chips, uh, which you know no one is going to get access to here. That's that's ridiculous. But so let's take a look at some of the examples first. Um, these were some of the ones that uh, made people like pretty excited about this model. So one is explaining a joke. So did you see that Google just hired an eloquent whale for their TPU team? It showed them how to communicate between two different pods. So pods are what you call like these the TPU pods and also a group of whales is a pod. So I guess this is, you know, some sort of joke. Um, and, <laughs> and then the model is asked to explain the joke. So it says, TPUs are a type of computer chip that Google uses for deep learning. A pod is a group of TPUs. Pod is also a group of whales. The joke is that the whale is able to communicate between two groups of whales, but the speaker is pretending that the whale is able to communicate between two groups of TPUs. So um, this is pretty interesting. Uh, not sure what would happen if you took a different sample. Like, um, Although also interesting with this paper is that with all these huge language models, they tend to decode from the model using just greedy decoding, so they don't actually use any sampling or beam search or anything like that. I think one reason is because it's actually quite difficult to implement these uh, decoding algorithms within their code base. Um, but also, I think when the model is strong enough, greedy decoding is actually quite good. Um, so that's another difference from all the models we've been discussing so far is that Greedy decoding results in all these like repetitions and other things, but with these huge scale models, that seems to be much less of a problem. Um, so there's another uh, example they have here, logical inference. So Shelley's from Virginia, but is visiting that city with that famous market where they throw the fish, going home next Tuesday. Question, is it likely that Shelley will be near the Pacific Ocean this week? So the model is trying to explain why it reaches a certain answer. So it says, the city with the famous market where they throw the fish is Seattle, Washington. Seattle is on the Pacific Ocean. Shelley is visiting Seattle, so she will be near the Pacific Ocean this weekend. The answer is yes, it is likely that Shelley will be near the Pacific Ocean this weekend. So it explained all of its steps of reasoning to arrive at this particular answer. And like zooming out a little, you can see that um, a model that can actually explain what steps that it's taking to do something is going to be much more useful overall than a model that can just spit out yes or no, right? Because people will actually be able to validate those steps of reasoning, see where the model might have gone wrong, and um, learn maybe more, uh, they can use this model with, with more trust potentially. However, there's a downside because you don't know if an error in this explanation actually corresponds to what the model is doing internally, right? The model may be able to produce these steps of reasoning, but it may not actually be executing these steps to arrive at its answer. So there's a missing connection between the model's ability to generate an explanation and the actual steps of reasoning, which we don't know what it's doing. Um, so that is always going to be a tension, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later on. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we'll, we'll get to that um, in a bit. It's later on in the paper. Okay, so um, there's a couple of different things I wanted to do, but let's start with the model architecture. So here you can see like all of the different changes that they made to a vanilla transformer um, before training their model. So they changed the activation function. Um, there, we've talked about the ReLU activation function throughout this class. Uh, they use something called swig glue, which is uh, some sort of variant of a ReLU. So the swish activation is essentially a smooth version of the ReLU, and they add some learned parameters in here. It uh, seems to increase the um, quality of the model. Um, they changed some formulation of the uh, transformer block to get 15% faster training speed. So these are, these are basically optimization related changes to make training faster without sacrificing quality. And as we discussed when we were talking about the transformer, a lot of those design decisions were not validated, right? It, it's unclear which order some components should be in, should the norm happen before or after the attention or the feed forward layers. So um, at this scale, they're just trying to cut down on um, things that waste uh, compute. Um, they actually change the attention as well. They simplify the attention to use the same key and value projections for each head. So the only thing that differs is the query uh, projection matrices. The keys and values are the same for each head. So, you know, imagine me trying to explain this in the next semester. <laughs> it's it's going to be, uh, yeah. But um, again, they, they say that this has a neutral effect on model quality and training speed, but results in significant cost savings at decoding time. So again, their goal is to improve some efficiency aspect of the model. Um, they change the position embeddings. They share the input and output embedding matrices. So this means um, you have your subword embeddings at the input layer, and at the output you have a softmax matrix that is predicting which of the subwords to emit next. Um, these matrices have the same size, so you can actually just share them and you get a, a memory savings. Um, they don't use any bias terms, um, doesn't seem to help. And for their vocabulary, they use sentence piece uh, with 256K tokens. Um, and so this, they say, was chosen to support a large number of different languages in their training corpus. Um, so they're training on like all this text from the web and they have data from multiple different languages. So all of those can be represented with this uh, subword vocabulary. And they do some other things. Numbers are always split into individual digit tokens. So 123.5 would be 123.5, um, which I think is good. To, um, it would be stupid if like this was one subword, right? Okay, so they train three different models in this paper to examine the effect of model size. Um, so they have an 8 billion parameter model, which is, you know, actually sort of feasible for, for us on consumer grade GPUs. 62 billion, definitely not feasible, and then 540 billion, which is insane. Um, and you can see that they are changing these um, hyperparameters from these different model configurations, but as predicted by the scaling laws, none of these things really makes a big difference. And the important thing is just the total number of uh, parameters. So. The final model has 118 layers, 48 attention heads per layer. Um, this is the number of dimen the dimensionality of the hidden states in the model. Um, and they also do this thing where they increase the batch size during training. So they start with a smaller one and then increase it to 2048 um, sequences by the end of training. Um, not really sure why they did this, um, but maybe they detail it here and I, I didn't read that. Okay, so let's also talk about the training data set. Um, as predicted by the Chinchilla paper, the training data is 
equally as important as scaling up the model. So it's important to have a high quality data set that has a diverse um, collection of domains and, and other things. Um, so their data set is a mix of filtered web pages and they use some sort of classifier to score high quality versus low quality web pages um, based on some annotations that they did. Um, books, Wikipedia, news articles, source code, and social media conversations. So they have a huge variety of things. They train all three of their different sized models on exactly one epoch of the data. Um, and they choose the mixing proportions to avoid repeating data in at least in any subcomponent. So they will see exactly one time each, um, uh, each input in this data set. And so, uh, as you can see, they are not training to convergence, right? They have picked, they've decided that we will run through this data set once and we'll stop training. That's it. Um, it if they were to train to convergence, it might take, you know, like 10 epochs, which would be probably years for even Google to train a model like this. Um, and their source code comes from GitHub, so they crawl all the open source GitHub repos. So this model is probably going to be very good for things like code generation or comment to code and stuff like that. So maybe we'll see applications using this model in the future like we have seen from Codex and, and so on. Okay, so here are the proportions of their data. They have most of the data consist of social media conversations. Um, then, um, yeah, not sure that's a great decision. Uh, filtered web pages, English books, and GitHub, Wikipedia, and um, news data. So I think another important open question is how do you decide this and how does it even affect the, um, the model that you train afterwards. Like, it would be really nice to see several models of equal size trained on different mixtures and see if they have different capabilities um, or if they differ at all in terms of their performance on these downstream tasks. Um, I suspect we'll see more work like this in the future probably from these huge labs uh, until it becomes more um, accessible to all. But the shift definitely seems to be in the direction of the data sets being equally as important as the models. So we'll just skip over this training stuff because it is not relevant to anything we've talked about in this class um, and get straight to the experiments. Oh, I, I did want to highlight this. Um, this is a very strange phenomenon that has been observed not only by this paper, but also several other of these huge scale language model training um, uh, um, runs. So for the largest model, we observed spikes in the loss roughly 20 times during training, despite the fact that gradient clipping was enabled. These spikes occurred at highly irregular intervals, sometimes happening late into training, were not observed when training smaller models. Due to the cost of training the largest model, we were not able to determine a principled strategy to mitigate these spikes. So they don't know how the spikes occur and they don't know, uh, you know how to fix them when they do occur. So they had this hacky solution to, um, which you know is very reasonable. We restarted training from a checkpoint roughly 100 steps before the spike started and skipped roughly 200 to 500 data batches, which cover the batches that were seen before and during the spike. With this mitigation, the loss did not spike again at the same point. We do not believe that the spikes were caused by bad data per se, because we ran several ablation experiments where he took the batches of data that were surrounding the spike and then trained on those same data batches starting from a different earlier checkpoint. In, this case, in these cases, we did not see a spike which implies that spikes only occur due, the co due to the combination of specific data batches with a particular model parameter state. So um, this is pretty crazy because if they didn't do this, their model might have just spiked up to some loss and been completely unusable. But the data was not like poisoned or malicious in any way. It was just um, 
for some random reason, this happened, and it happened 20 times during the training process. Uh, this seems to be a pretty large problem overall. Um, actually, there's this uh, thing called, I think, Big Science or something like that, where they're like open source training one of these huge scale models, and their loss curves are all public, so you can go and see like what the model's loss is. And they have these huge spikes at, at intervals, and no one really knows why they happen. Um, but they seem to only happen with these huge models. Um, another weird, unexplained thing so far that maybe we'll find out what's happening five years from now. <laughs> I don't know. All right, so I really wanted to get to the results of this paper and look at some of the experiments. I will skip over all of these standard data sets because you know um, we've seen we've seen them before on GPT-3 and other models. Um, basically, this new POM model is better than all models that came before on all the standard tasks that we've looked at. Um, but I wanted to talk about this set of experiments. So there's this uh, big bench benchmark which has about 150 tasks that are intended for evaluating the few shot capabilities of these models. Um, so we can look at some of the uh, tasks first. So one of the tasks is called goal step. It comes from WikiHow. The goal is to reason about goal step relationship between ev events. For example, given so the model is given this input. In order to clean silver, which step should be done first? A, dry the silver. B, hand wash the silver. And the model has to pick which is the correct answer here. Um, there's also this logical ARDS. So here, the students told the substitute teacher they were learning trigonometry. The substitute told them that instead of teaching them useless facts about triangles, he would instead teach them how to work with probabilities. What is he implying? So here it's asking um, for something more subtle that is not actually directly stated in the text. So here the choices are, he believes that mathematics does not need to be useful to be interesting. He thinks prob understanding probability is more useful than trigonometry. He believes that probability theory is a useless subject and the model has to pick the correct one. So there's other things like English proverbs, so which proverb best is most appropriate for this given situation. Um, all of these can be evaluated in either the zero shot or the few shot setting. So in the few shot setting, you might give you know, like up to eight of these example uh, situation choice and answer pairs, and then you give the model a new one that, uh, and ask it to predict the answer, just like we saw with GPT-3. Any questions about that, that setup? Yeah, 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 that's a good point. So uh, how do we actually do this in the few shot case? Um, I think what they do is they, uh, they give this whole thing as input, and the model has to generate the letter of the correct choice. So uh, it's not like they, they pass in three different inputs with each of these three choices and then pick the one that is most probable. The model actually has to generate this. So uh, on 58 of these tasks, um, you can see this uh, solid blue, dark blue line here. This is the performance of the POM model, and this is with five shots. So it has five examples in the context. Um, and so this gray dashed line is the average human performance, and the solid da black line, up, uh, sorry, the dashed black line up at top is the best human performance. I think this is like human experts or something. So this is much worse than the best humans, but it's still much better than all competing models. Uh, Chinchilla is over here, the um, brown one, so it's actually quite competitive, despite being much smaller than, than this model. Okay, so... Um, yeah, and they're showing here, like, you know, it really improves the state of the art. It's not particularly interesting. Um, but, uh, yeah, there are some harder tasks. So one that is not solved at all by any model so far is this navigate task. So you can see how this could be difficult. Uh, 
Um, if you follow these instructions, do you return to the starting point? Always face forward, take six steps left, seven steps forward, eight steps. I mean, this would be hard for a human, right? Uh, but I think we could figure it out given enough time. Um, if you look at the model performance, it's close to 0%. Um, and this 540 billion parameter model gets up to something, but yeah, it's still way worse than the average human and the best human gets 100%. So um, a lot of room for improvement there. But these curves are actually very interesting overall. Um, they show that uh, the improvement from 8 billion to 62 billion on some of these tasks is nowhere close to the improvement from 62 billion to 540 billion. Um, so that indicates for some of these tasks that the capability to solve that task is only unlocked when the model has reached a significantly huge size. So 8 billion is not that small. And scaling from 8 billion to 62 billion is still like a huge endeavor for any even company to do. Um, but it seems for some of these tasks that the real regime of interest is in even larger scaling of the model up to like 540 billion parameters. So, all of these curves do not make anyone, you know, pessimistic about what will happen when you further scale up these models, right? These look like they're increasing. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows, maybe we'll have a trillion parameter model trained over three trillion tokens that um, can actually solve this navigate task. Uh, this is not particularly exciting from a research perspective, but from getting some model that can solve this task, it is, uh, you know, pretty interesting. Okay, so um, I wanted to get to the uh, chain of thought prompting. So this is in their reasoning section of the paper. So there's a couple of these multi-step arithmetic or common sense uh, problems that require the model to perform multiple steps of reasoning before it can get to the correct answer. So let's see, like one example here. Roger has five tennis balls. He buys two more cans of tennis balls. Each can has three tennis balls. How many tennis balls does he have now? And, you know, the default task format would just be to provide this model with the answer. So now he has 11. So the model would just have to produce 11, and then it would have answered this, this question. But we know if we were to solve this question, we probably would write down this into some sort of, you know, algebraic expression maybe, or at least write the individual steps that we would take before we get down to this, uh, this answer. And if we don't write it down, we, that's how we would do the problem, right? Um, and in the common sense case, Sean was in a rush to get home, but the light turned yellow and he was forced to do what? Take time, dawdle, go slowly, uh, ocean, <laughs> slow down. Um, so here, you need to know um, a couple of things. You need to know Sean was in a rush to get home, so he's probably going fast, and the light turned yellow, and so that is, um, both of those things combined make it likely that he needs to slow down. Um, so it's not just knowing about the common sense, like if there's a yellow light, you should come to a stop. It's also knowing that you know he was in a rush, so he's probably speeding before. Um, so you need to make two inferences here. So this is uh, one of the coolest parts of this paper, is how do you actually solve these kinds of tasks? So in standard prompting, as we mentioned, you see some number of inputs in your prompt of the form Q and A. So you get the question, you get the answer, you might get five or 10 of these, and then you get a question, you put in A colon, and you ask the model to generate something like the answer is 50, and you evaluate whether that is correct or not. But one advantage of this whole setup is that in these few shot settings, you don't actually need that much data to put into the prompt, right? You might get only eight or five or 10 labeled examples that you're putting into the prompt. So it's really not that difficult to make your um, examples that you're putting in the prompt as high quality and informative to the model as possible. Because you don't need to collect, you know, like hundreds of thousands of examples like in Squad or MNLI anymore. You just need 
you know, five or ten, right? So why not make those illustrative examples to try and teach the model how to solve the task? So if you look on the right, this is called chain of thought prompting. Each prompt includes an explanation of how you arrive at the answer. So in this question, Roger started with five balls. Two cans of three tennis balls each is six tennis balls. Five plus six equals 11. The answer is 11. So now each example also includes this explanation along with the answer. So then finally you get a held out question. The cafeteria had 23 apples. Did they use 20 to make lunch and bought six more? How many apples do they have? Now instead of just producing the answer, the model has to produce an explanation followed by an answer following the prompt format. So it will say, the cafeteria had 23 apples originally, they used 20 to make lunch. So they had 23 minus 20 equals three, they bought six more apples, so they have three plus six equals nine. The answer is nine. So you can see that these arithmetic equations are in here um, and all of this description of the steps necessary to solve this answer, uh, solve this problem. And the interesting thing, as we'll see in the experiments, is that chain of thought prompting for these kinds of tasks is way more effective than standard prompting. So even though the model is being evaluated on the exact same thing, like is the, what it generates for the answer correct or not, it gets it right way more of the time when it also is forced to produce an explanation and when it sees these explanations um, in the prompt. So that is uh, you know, pretty interesting and promising for future work on these language models. Um, so I wanted to show the results here because they're pretty striking. So this is for the arithmetic uh, word problem um, task. And we see that the POM 540 billion parameter model plus the chain of thought prompting and they have some sort of external calculator. I'm not sure exactly how they um, use that calculator, but um, this is able to obtain an accuracy of 58%. Um, without the calculator, it gets 54%. And without the chain of thought prompting, it gets 17%. So you can see from 17 to 54%, just this huge gain when you make the model produce explanations of how it arrived at the answer. And you can see that even the 62 billion parameter model with chain of thought prompting is, is doing better than the huge model without the chain of thought prompting. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think um, there, there are many more interesting things in this paper that um, you all can check out if you have a chance or are interested. I won't go over them now, but the chain of thought prompting is a really interesting approach that has only been like lightly explored so far, right? You could imagine taking this kind of approach and using it to solve a variety of other tasks where the reasoning perhaps is not as explicit as, you know, this is an equation that is necessary to solve the problem. Um, perhaps this could be really useful for many tasks, like even um, more open-ended tasks where you could ask the model, you know, even if you're doing something as creative as story generation, you could first force the model to generate like a plan of a scene and then generate the actual text rather than just forcing it to go from prompt to story immediately. So there are many, many different applications and the cool part is that you probably don't need that many examples of uh, you know, um, inputs paired with explanations to do a lot of tasks. And so um, we'll probably see more and more work into this chain of thought prompting in, in the future. Okay, so I think I wanna stop there, and if there are any questions, um, we can talk about them. Yeah. So, is it prompting the model on the chain of thought prompting, or is it just in the, the prompt? Yeah, in here, the, they're just in the prompt, so there's no fine tuning done. You can see in um, this, uh, this case here, they, uh, they actually fine tune GPT 3 on this, uh, these prompts and so on. 
but their model is not fine tuned. It's just in the prompt, and they're achieving like better better results. So, yeah. Other questions? So the question is, how many people work on these kinds of um, experiments once the model has been trained? Oh, so yeah, these you can look at the number of authors on this paper to get a good idea of that. Well, we went quite far. So that's a lot of people. <laughs> um, so generally, when you look at one of these, the more uh, senior people will be uh, present on the just like idea generation and high level uh, structuring and ordering of these papers. But the people who are the first authors here, so here there's three of them. These are the people that did all the implementation or most of the implementation. And for this paper, we're probably the ones who primarily uh, dealt with the training of this huge model. I would expect that all of the middle authors contributed in different ways to the different experiments on various tasks and benchmarks. So like taking this trained model now that these people have made it and then just evaluating it over a bunch of different tasks. Um, there's also people here who are looking for like ethical issues or looking for um, writing up the details of the data set and um, people that are focused on the small improvements that are made to optimize the efficiency of this model. So this is a huge effort. And if you look at any of these other papers that are doing these huge scale models, like probably this chinchilla one has, you know, a, a lot of people as well. So, you know, training one of these models is not just the cost of the compute, but also it's like a, a large number of researchers and engineers who are working on, on this uh, until it's done. Other questions? One on YouTube. Okay, for all of you and the two YouTube viewers, <laughs> it's been a good semester. Um, hope you enjoyed the material. Uh, you have a couple more things left to submit and the grades um, for your projects will be done within a week of the uh, submission deadline, mostly because we have to do it <laughs> within a week. So have a good rest of the semester and good luck with all your exams and projects and stuff. <laughs>